Dove Seedman is one of the thoughtful, most thoughtful people I know on this subject, so I've invited him for, to have a conversation. Then we're going to bring uh, others of you in as well to try and set the stage for what we'll be doing over the next 24 hours. And Dove, let me just start off by asking, how did we get here? You know, why, why are we having this conversation? I mean, I think, Alan, first, it's great to be with you. Um, I think in rapid order, the world has not just rapidly changed. I think it's dramatically been reshaped. It operates differently. And I think it's been reshaped faster than we've reshaped ourselves, our institutions, our businesses, uh, and our leadership. The implications I've, are profound. The imperative, when I describe the ways in which the world has been reshaped, is moral in nature. Let me illustrate. Uh, about a year ago, a dentist woke up in Minneapolis and went on Facebook and described a trip he was going to take to Zimbabwe to hunt a lion. He had a legal permit to do this, and he landed in Zimbabwe, and he killed Cecil. Within minutes, moral outrage engulfed the world. People went on to Yelp to uh, try to drive him out of business by posting reviews that I could not repeat here. They published the address of his Florida vacation home, and then people went and spray painted this lion killer. And you might ask, what does this have to do with business? Within a few days, 400,000 people went online and it, with the same vitriol, they protested Delta Airlines for flying back from Zimbabwe, the trophy kill. So Delta Airlines was under siege and they immediately thought it through and they banned and they changed their policy, no more flying back with trophy kills. And then 39 Airlines had to do the same thing. But then they got protested for how they handled the protest because that was a legal activity and they got protested for discriminating against lion killing. And this went on and on and on. And as you sit here, just in the last week, if you Google New Balance, Starbucks, Delta again, company after company, because of some video that went viral, is finding itself with its eye off of what was once its business ball. So David Hume, the moral philosopher, said that the moral imagination diminishes with distance. As a corollary, I think it would follow that as distance decreases, the moral imagination increases. I'll repeat that. As distance decreases, the moral imagination increases. I think we are living in a no-distance world where people are morally awakened and activated. We're able to feel the plights and challenges and anger and anguish and actions of people far away viscerally and directly. And Alan, if I could just take a minute, this uh, no-distance world has three features. The first is interdependence. We've gone from interconnected to interdependent, and that's a moral reality because we rise and fall together. One vegetable vendor in Tunisia was able to spark a revolution towards freedom throughout the entire Middle East. In addition to interdependence, we are also um, able, there's intimate proximity. Strangers, migrants looking for a better life are in our neighborhoods or neighborhoods, but with one swipe on an on a handheld device, you can get into a car or a home. We've never had strangers come into intimate proximity so fast. And now we're not just x-raying companies. With MRI visions, we are able to look into the inner workings of organizations. And they think of how Sony got hacked from North Korea. And we're starting to see the attitudes and beliefs of those who run them and how they're making money. So, Dove, take that the next step. What does that mean? I started off by saying yeah. that there is, a, there is a sense of crisis in yeah. capitalism. I mean, it was Milton Friedman who said the social responsibility of business is to make a profit. Right. Uh, but what you're saying seems to suggest that approach doesn't work in this new world. Well, in this new world, this uh, awakening presents itself as outrage. And when outrage goes right to demand, I want your resignation, I want your apology, or a riot or protest, you cannot solve and create moral progress if you go from the sense of outrage to resolution. And where leadership needs to come in, it needs to pause and say, a guy killed the lion, but he's not a member of ISIS. If we're not going to have the conversation, if we're not going to reflect and engage in reasoning, if we go right from outrage to demand, we'll make no progress. The same thing is happening with capitalism. If we don't pause and ask how is it working, how it's not. I've never met an employee that gets out of bed, Alan, to make money for a shareholder. Employees get out of bed to have a good career and a good life and make a difference. You know, um, since you brought up um, Milton Friedman, the true father of capitalism 
was Adam Smith. And Adam Smith was not an economist, you probably most of you know. He was the chairman of the moral philosophy department at Glasgow University when he wrote The Wealth of Nations. He never used the word capitalism. It was a moral system. And he understood that business is not really fundamentally about equality. It's about liberty. And he talked about scaling a system of liberties. He understood that when people are free to pursue their self-interest, their dreams, if you can create a marketplace where that happens, then prosperity and human progress are the result. And what's happening right now is this reshaped world is creating a new inequality. In addition to inequality of income, we now have what I think is inequality of freedom. More people have been able to cast off authority, autocracy, dictatorships. Think of Brexit, you cast it off uh, you know, the EU. Amazon, freedom from the neighborhood store. Facebook, freedom from you know, traditional media or corporate communications doing all the talking because all employees can talk. So we are creating unprecedented levels of freedom from. But the freedom that Adam Smith talked about is freedom too, or the freedom in the Magna Carta or the US Constitution is freedom to pursue happiness, to pursue your dreams. And right now we have all these people who are, have freedom from, and leadership needs to create the true possibility of freedom too, to be yourself, to innovate, uh, to pursue a business. And, and if we don't, then all these people that are free from are gonna feel excluded and we have to include them. So what does that mean to the people sitting in this room and the purpose we have here for the next two days? What, what specifically can they do to address this explosion of moral outrage that you're talking about? I, if we accept that we're in a reshaped world, we need to reshape our organizations, our businesses, and then we need a new reshaped leadership playbook. So um, there's one more thing I think we need to take account of. Artificial intelligence. You know, machines are not just out producing us, they're starting to outthink us. And I think that's creating some more uh, of this sense of uh, unmooring. And I think economic advantage is shifting from what it used to be to behavior, how we do what we do, how we relate to others, how we collaborate, how we harness human potential. It's shifting not to how many relationships we have, but to deep, loyal relationships. And it's shifting in a world where business and society have fused, it's shifting to how you make a difference in the world. In many ways, I think we've gone from the industrial age where we hired brawn, hands, to the knowledge economy when we went cognitively, hired heads, and now I think we're entering the human economy where we're hiring hearts. And I think business has to embrace the imperative of putting the heart at the one thing a machine does not have. Machines might outthink us, but they're not gonna outfeel us. How do we put the heart at the center of organizations and recapture the heart of consumers? And the, only way, and the reason I'm so optimistic about business, business exists to do things at scale. To scale something, you have to create a system. Think ERP, HRIS, TQM, Kaizen Six Sigma, CSR, CRM. Business has done a marvelous job systematizing some aspect of itself so it could do it at global scale. I think we now need to embrace the final frontier to really systematize the forces that bear on behavior. Because right now, you, one of you might say to a colleague, I trust you to innovate. And the person runs off to innovate, and then they've got to get four signatures to spend $12 to innovate. Please go on Facebook if we're attacked. And then the compliance department puts out a social media policy that says, don't you dare go on Facebook. Right now, the governance, culture, and leadership of most organizations is still from the industrial age. And I think that we need to create human, a more human operating system where governance goes from not using carrots and sticks applied to what we can and cannot do, but understanding that we're in a should, should not world, and we need to put values and purpose at the core and scale values-based governance and culture. And I think that leadership needs to move from carrots and sticks to a more inclusive, inspirational leadership that truly elevates human behavior. So I think the imperative of business is to create a human uh, operating system. So you've put a huge uh, uh, number of ideas yeah. on the table here in a very short period of time, and I'd love to yeah. uh, hear from some of the people in the group about that. But I think before we do that, uh, 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 Richard Branson has agreed to this. Uh, this is also a topic you've thought about uh, for a number of years uh, to give us some thoughts, and then we'll uh, open up the conversation. Uh, Richard, if you want to take the podium. Um, well, th first of all, thanks very much uh, to Time for pulling all this together. Uh, it's an incredible group of people and a very important topic. Um, well, these are 
very trying times. Uh, 2016 has been a year of seismic shifts and tremors. Brexit in the UK and the US election have created greater uncertainties than most of us have ever known in our lifetimes. And not for the first time, we've got aggressive nationalism and divisive populism. Uh, they're rearing their ugly heads around the world. They may inflict further damage yet as voters in France, in Germany, the Netherlands, and other European countries head to the polls next year. At the same time, we've got the rule of law, this unclad principle of modern governance and an important safeguard for the stability of markets and the prosperity of enterprise. That's coming under attack. We see it in Turkey, where the government's pursuit of those involved in the failed military coup has turned into a vast purge of political dissent without any regard for due process. We see it in the Philippines, where the president has launched an all-out war of extrajudicial killings in the guise of fighting drugs. And we've already started to see it in the US, where the president-elect, amongst other things, has openly declared his support for torture. To make things worse, liberal democracy and an increasingly integrated and interconnected global economy that is mutually reinforcing drivers of human progress is being rejected. And while many of us will agree with those who argue that globalization has delivered its benefits in a very uneven manner and helped create enormous fault lines of inequality, I also think that much of the current dissent is being fueled and exasperated by the very poor political leadership. There is no question moral leadership will be in high demand for years to come. Moral leadership is not just any leadership. It certainly isn't the type of leadership that muscles its way through global challenges without regard for casualties. There are many of you in this room that are beautiful examples of moral leadership. Principal leadership that understands certain values and rights to be universal and non-negotiable Leadership that accepts that the long-term sustainability of our actions is more important than short-term gain in business as much as in politics. A good test of our capacity for moral leadership is whether we're willing to accept that the fruits of our work may not be ours to harvest. It's the relentless pursuit of recognition, affirmation, and instant gratification that often gets in the way of long-term thinking for the common good. There was a great indigenous tribe, and I've said that because I couldn't pronounce it, <laughs> that laid down a principle that every decision we make today could deliver a sustainable result for at least seven generations to come. In this day and age of short-termism and quarterly results, how far have we strayed from this idea? Anyway, this appears to be a good segue into the discussion on the importance of moral leadership across all sectors and the opportunity for all of us in this room to humbly acknowledge mistakes made and embrace a more inclusive approach. And I thought uh, there's one person in this room who exemplifies good moral leadership, and that's Mo Ibrahim. You're, you're going to be asked the first question. Um, you've been a fantastic leader uh, in moral leadership in the public and both the public sector. And I thought we'd start by asking you where you're seeing traction, where you're still seeing barriers, and what are the biggest opportunities for us all to put our collective weight behind it? And if somebody could bring him a microphone, that'd be great. Up front. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Richard, for putting me uh, on the spot. Uh, <laughs> we're talking about uh, really uh, moral leaderships and you correctly said, Alan, that we have a problem. Young people actually no longer believe in capitalism, and we need to ask ourselves why. We really had some serious problems which have been exasperated over the years. Transparency and connectivity exasperated all these issues. As business leader, I just need to ask some, some questions. Uh, let's talk about corruption and bribery are really taking a proper stand against that beyond issuing statements on our boards that we're against bribery and then we allow our consultants to do all the hanky-banky on the side and don't ask, don't tell. I think that is a serious issue. 
be able to notice and raise resentment. Secondly, tax. Are we paying taxes where profits really are made? Or are we playing all these aggressive games which enrages people, really enrages people? Uh, is, that, is that right? I know, the, unfortunately, governments are not very help, helpful. Business gone global, but taxation is still in silos. But with the OCED uh, new initiative, uh, I hope uh, that issue will be sorted out. But people resent very much what are we doing with our taxation regime. We are close, sailing very close to the wind there. And we need to be careful about that because that produces uh, a backlash. Uh, we have been in something called the B team, which is a wonderful initiative actually initiated by uh, and conceived by Richard. We have been fighting for the abolition of the so-called anonymous companies. Anonymous companies, trustees companies, which nobody knows who own it. And we say legitimate business have no need for anonymous companies. We cannot have this in our balance sheet. Why do they exist? Clearly, it is a getaway car to hide hot money. If you are a drug dealer, a corrupt politician, what you do? Where do you keep your loot? You keep it in anonymous companies. We have been fighting for that. How many of you did join us in that fight? How many of you wrote to the G20 leaders to urge him to take action there? How many of you joined David Cameron in the corruption conference in London recently? Where is business? Where is the moral leadership of business? I think that's a legitimate question uh, uh, really uh, uh, to, to ask. Uh, one issue about climate. Uh, you know and I know that climate is not a conspiracy or hoax uh, uh, invented by China as your president-elect suggested. Are we taking action there? Uh, do we monitor our carbon footprint? When you talk about profit, yes, profit is the main, main or sole purpose for business. What happened is just we need to define what is profit. I think to reduce carbon, that should be added to our profit statement. It is a profit. To take people out of poverty is a profit. We need just to understand better what do we mean by profit. Profit is not just cash, but profit is things which uh, really help. Finally, one point actually which enrages people out there if you are not aware. The issue of the executive pay. I give you an example. Last year in UK, we have an austerity regime. Salaries are, have been capped, no increases below, above one and a half or two percent. The executive pay of the top companies or the CEOs of the top companies, the FTSE 100, increased by 10 percent. Now, somebody who earns on average five million pounds a year took 10 percent increase. That's half a million pounds. While the employees in the same companies at 30 or 40 thousand pounds took one percent pay increase, which is 400 or 500 pounds. Is that fair? Is that fair? Is that our moral compass? Do we accept that? And I think it is up to us to really, yeah. because the barbarians are at the gate. And we are dancing while Rome is burning. So I think we just really have to be careful. This is a very dangerous moment. Yeah. This looks like the certes. We need to step, step up and take care of these crucial issues. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So, so we are only 15 minutes into this day, and we've got a lot of big issues on the table here already, uh, talking about corruption, talking about transparency, talking about climate change, talking about uh, uh, pay equity. Uh, um, 
you know, the nice thing about a bottom line is it's pretty well defined. It's pretty easy to, uh, to calculate and to see what it is. Can you just say a word about this issue of moral leadership that Richard and, and yeah. Mo were talking about? What do we mean when we talk about sure. moral leadership? Well, first, let me make an argument for it, and then I'll define it. I mean, a military general would, used to say, let's take that hill, and soldiers would go take that hill. Or a CEO and the executive team would say, these are the numbers. Let's go make them. In that world, everybody's job is to every day do the next thing right. When we want everybody to participate and form connections and delight customers and innovate and bring their full self to the job, we're no longer asking employees to do the next thing right, but to do the next right thing. We're asking for morality from our folks. And if we're going to ask for their full human self and morality, we're going to need to relate to them from that standpoint. So to me, moral leadership is if you triple somebody's pay, they might work three times harder. But if you triple somebody's pay, they won't be more transparent, more collaborative, or more honest. Only morality can ele elevate another human being. If we enlist people in journeys worthy of their loyalty and dedication, they will lean in. If we relate to them not in terms of what they can and can't do, but what they should do. There's only three ways to get another human being to do something. You can coerce them, you can motivate them, or you can inspire them. Coercion and motivation are amoral. They're carrots and sticks. And I think right now we are asking of our people, of our customers, for behaviors and relationships that can only be generated through morality. Now, I think that the CEO's job is no longer to provide the vision thing, which it still is, or the direction. It's to shape context, consciousness, and culture. Because in a world where everybody's job is to do the next right thing, they need to have a shared understanding of what that is. And there's no program for this. There's no seven-step thing you do. It's about deep human work um, at the core. There is no world, Alan, without power and authority. You cannot get anything done without power and authority. But formal authority, do this because I'm your father, or do this because of my position relative to you, as we see, is being disruptive. It's decaying. It's being emasculated. So the only alternative to formal authority is going to be moral authority. That's authority uh, animated by virtue, somebody that puts others before him, him or herself. It's authority animated by principle. So the good news is we still need authority. The authority we've often used is losing its currency, and there's an opportunity for that vacuum to be filled with moral authority, which is the one that elevates. But a really big fundamental change in the way, in the way we all operate. Fundamental. Let me, you mentioned a few minutes ago the, the uh, rise of, of artificial intelligence yeah. and what that, how that is going to affect this uh, sure. ecosystem we're talking about in the future. Um, uh, Ginny Rometty, can I put you on the spot here, if, if, if you don't mind? Uh, because I know from our conversations that this is something that you've uh, uh, thought about uh, a lot, about how do you, you know, the role, the developing role of cognitive computing and how you instill trust in business uh, as this moves forward. Sure, Alan. Um, having been the inventor of this for the last 15 years, um, I do think this point about it is our obligation to have some moral authority and responsibility in these technologies. You aren't going to stop them. I mean, every era, whether it's been the agrarian era, the industrial age, they've all led to some sort of impact because this will lead to a discussion on jobs and the impact of education eventually. But my view is the goal is important of these technologies. And in fact, I wish it wasn't called artificial intelligence because I do think it's got a great role to augment intelligence. And in fact, that is the goal we've taken is what we've built. And I think this idea that the world has become too complex for people to deal with. Um, and that's why we called it cognitive, by the way. It's an overload. So you need something to help you. You will. And therefore, this idea that if these technologies are built right, they will actually create a better, a safer, a more productive, a healthier world that's out there. But that does come with responsibility and how they're done. And I do think they will impact people. And your, your comments a second ago about um, the impact of distance and it getting smaller and therefore what that means, I think this is very true with the backlash you see around the world uh, when we've talked about trade and whether trade's influenced by whether it's uh, agreements or technology, however you want to look at it, the impact on jobs and where you can make a, an argument at a macro level that all these things are good for the world, including AI or trade or anything else, 
when someone has been displaced in their individual job at a micro level, it is a really big issue. And so I know one of the things, I hope we're going to tee up, or I, well, I will because I'm the co-leader of my little session later, but um, <laughs> is, this, is this idea that while we can talk about these issues, you have to do something about them. And I do think we can do things that are broader than our own company. And because every of these discussions at a personal level to people, one of the issues it comes down to is their job and what they're able to do. And so I, the idea I'd like to tee up is this thought that one of the actions we can take is to create a new collar economy, not a blue collar, not a white collar, a new collar. There are many things that can be done uh, with different sorts of education that did not require the highest forms of education we all speak to that we all represent in this room to help address that inequality that's out there. And that is a world that is assisted by technology, but we can help many people rise and move into that working area. So I would go all the way from the topic of AI does need to be about augmentation and have the right goal to assist, but that in the end will take itself all the way back down to jobs and education. And this idea of maybe a new collar economy is the what to build around the world. Good, thank you. Why don't we open it up? I'm sure there are lots of people in the room who have uh, uh, comments, thoughts, questions about the discussion so far, and we have a little time. Uh, 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 right there in the back, please. I, I, I've got lights in my face, so I can't see you, but introduce yourself and, and make your comment. Yeah, and I'm Damon Silvers. I'm the policy director of the AFL-CIO. Um, I'm very struck by this conversation that we've just been talking in somewhat general terms about about ethics and the globalized environment in which that collides with, in which that collides with business. And um, at the same time, uh, Richard Branson, I think, spoke with some specificity, uh, at least to me as an American, uh, about a precise ethical question that we are all going to have to face, at least those of us in this room who are Americans. And I'm curious about what our guest speaker thinks specifically about the question of how should American business and civil society institutions, such as the one that I represent, respond to the assertion of our president-elect that our country should engage in torture? That our country should engage in uh, torture. torture. Which is not the core issue of our day, but do you have any uh, uh, thoughts on that? Well. I think you fight that with everything you've got. I mean, what can I say? It's, it's, things are, it's wrong. Um, you know, leadership is not about headlines. It's about trend lines. I think our responsibility is to have a philosophical point of view about the world and where it's going. I think the arc of the war of towards justice, as Martin Luther King said, is long, but the arc away from old school leadership, be it autocracy, thuggery. Uh, what I love about business is, and sports, there has not been a championship won in any sport with an old school dictatorial top-down autocratic coach in about eight years. And that's hockey, the European football, American football. Uh, there has not, companies, look at all of you. We all know that command and control top-down is losing its currency. The fact that politics is 20 to 30 years behind business, because business has really learned how to collaborate and think more progressively, that's why business needs to lead the way. Um, so my first answer to your question is it's wrong, and I think business needs to keep its eye on the trend lines um, and not be too put off course just because the headlines are incompatible with where we think it ought to go. Uh, a question here in the back. Uh, my name is David Miliband. I'm the president of the International Rescue Committee, which is an international humanitarian charity. Um, I wonder if the core of moral leadership is not that what you say in private and what you do in public are consistent. And isn't the biggest change in the modern world the radical transparency that is exposing when leaders are sometimes saying different things in private from what they're doing in public? And from my background in politics and now in an NGO, it seems to me that the greatest sin is not to be wrong, the greatest sin is to be a hypocrite, saying one thing and doing another, and I'd be interested in the comments on that. It's an interesting point, yeah. You know, uh, one, one of the things that allows human beings to even take a step forward is time and space. We use time and space to get perspective, we use time and space to think things through. 
We're living in a world right now where time and space have gone to zero, and uh, we just don't know how to operate. And everything that makes us imperfect is revealing itself. And uh, I'm, I'm totally with you that, uh, you know, the inner workings of how our attitudes, our beliefs, uh, when they are being exposed to the light of day, um, but I couldn't agree more. Moral leadership is about walking the talk, but uh, saying what you mean, but also meaning what you say. Do you have a quick final word of advice to all of us as we embark on the next uh, 24 hours? Anything to keep in mind? It does have to be yeah. quick because they'll, they'll... Yeah, I'd say this. I, I think that we know that life is a journey because what makes a journey a journey is it's curvilinear. It goes up and down. Uh, and in life, we get good at being at a journey. We bounce back, we're resilient, we stay hopeful, we make mistakes. We just, we love and we know how to journey in our lives. Business has insisted on linearity. And I think this idea that we're gonna, through planning and budgeting and analytics, superimpose a linear future on a corporation, we just need to just kill that idea. Linearity is over in this reshaped world. And if business and life and society are fusing, if business gets back to the ethos of journeying, which is about progress, which is about experimentation, when a CEO defines his or her path ahead as a journey and scales the ethic and ethos of journeying, which is true, you know, the last time a U.S. president, Alan, uh, said uh, we shall land on the moon, what was more impressive was he said within a decade. Every problem we're facing is at least 10 years or more to solve. And we know that. The scale of the problems is out there. Uh, I think it's time to describe the future as a journey and be relentless in making progress in that direction. Nothing elevates a human being more than not being an instrument on, you, on your plan, but rather being inspired and enlisted to be on a journey totally worthy of their dedication and commitment. So if you can define the path ahead as a journey and scale that and get rid of linearity, I think uh, optimism has a chance. Dub, thank you. Very it's a pleasure much for getting us started. Thank you.